Welcome back to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik, where we bring you news, politics, and culture without the red and blue treatment. I'm John Kiriakou here with Ben Zinovich. The economy added 216,000 jobs in December, while unemployment held at 3.7%. The labor market added a whopping 2.7 million jobs in 2023, while unemployment has remained under 4% for two consecutive years. That is a feat not accomplished since the 1960s. Average hourly wages were up in 2023 by 4.7% to $34.27 per hour, beating inflation. Interest rates have not come down, but Fed notes re- recently released earlier this week indicate that that will likely happen soon. But in the meantime, the national debt rose to more than $34 trillion for the first time ever. We're going to talk about all this with Steve Grumbine. He's founder and CEO of the nonprofits Real Progressives and Real Progress in Action and host of the podcast Macro and Cheese. He's also a leading activist and evangelist for modern monetary theory, so he can talk sense to us about this $34 trillion budget uh, or uh, national debt, I should say. Steve, welcome back. Always great having you. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. You'll have to forgive me. I got to give a preemptive my mother took a major fall, so I'm actually in your backyard over here near oh. George Washington University Hospital. Oh, my gosh. She went to the trauma center, so uh, she's on the right side of it, so I felt like, okay, I can do my duty and also oh. take a call and do this. So here well, we are. I, so anyways, may it pass give me quickly. some latitude. I may it pass quickly, yes. Steve, and I'll tell you, um, I, I spent eight days in the trauma unit at uh, GW Hospital when I got in an accident a couple of years ago and broke like my entire body. They took good care of me, and I know they'll take good care of her. Amen. Yes, yeah. sir. They're really pros of, over there. Good people. And the food's actually well, not bad. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Good. Well, Steve, uh, let's start with the economy adding 216,000 jobs in December and adding 2.7 million jobs in all of 2023. That's pretty amazing. And it seems to give credence to comments from the Fed that the economy has indeed achieved this so-called soft landing. Do you agree with that? Is this all around good news or is there a downside to it? Well, I mean, anytime you add jobs, that's good. Um, but, But I think it's important to note that just because they bled the patient with leeches. Yeah. Doesn't mean what the Fed did was good. I don't want to conflate good with poison. Um, What the Fed did effectively by jacking interest rates up to quote unquote knock down inflation was they basically gave the rich a lot more money. That was just a straight mainline feed of interest payments to people who already have money. You could think of this sort of like as a tribute to say, hey guys, maybe maybe back up off of the uh, price gouging a little bit. We're, mm-hmm. we're gonna throw some money your way. And, and there are far more effective ways and ways that don't require payola to the wealthy and to these large corporations to, to effectively bring prices down. And unfortunately, our free market-minded government uh, would rather allow capital to run game. And what they did was they paid them off. I mean, interest rates are a payoff to the rich. So with that in mind, it's just, hey, you know, is it good? Do we have jobs? Sure, we have jobs. Have the wages for those jobs gone up? No, they no. have not. Right. Have they gone down? Yes, they have. Well, you know, have I have to interrupt you there, too. Gone up? I, I was yes. amused at this this $34.27 an hour. I, I calculated that. It comes out to $71,000 a year. I don't know a whole lot of people making $71,000 a year. I, I, I don't know where they get this figure. I think what it is, is you've got so many people making 500,000, 600,000, a million a year that you offset that with all of the people making minimum wage and you can come up with $71,000 a year. So I think this is kind of a fake number. I, I think so too. And I think, you know, something that should be near and dear to your heart here in the nation's capital is the Washington Capitals and the Washington Wizards threatening to leave the city yeah. and move across the pond, so to speak, to where the average median income is, what, 147000 You're exactly right. And so, to me, I think that, that if you don't lop off the top 
10% on both directions, you don't really have a mean because the mean that they're looking at is so heavily skewed by the wealth and opulence of Northern Virginia and things like that. So I, I think that there's a lot to what you just said. It is a very, very misleading number. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it is a very misleading number. You know, looking back, just on a personal note, my my grandparents, my dad's parents um, lived in Farrell, Pennsylvania. Farrell only has about 7,000 people in it, and it's a company town. It didn't exist until 1902, and, and U.S. Steel opened a, a gigantic um, uh, steel plant there, and so they built the town around the plant. All the houses look exactly the same. So my grandparents um, were able to buy a house in 1946. They had rented before that. My dad grew up, you know, moving from company house to company house. And then finally they bought. Well, my dad sold the house in 1978 um, when my grandparents passed away or my grandfather passed away. And the house sold for 1600 bucks, 1600 bucks. And that's about what it's worth today. Uh, so this, these numbers pointing to just wild success that we've got the soft landing and interest rates are coming down and, oh, look, gas is only $3 a gallon again. Well, when you're making seven and a quarter an hour because your state didn't raise the, the minimum wage and hasn't raised the minimum wage in many, many years, and there just aren't enough jobs to go around in your dead rust bucket town, then you know what? These these economic numbers don't really mean anything. It's just when you take when you take away from people for a long period of time, and then all of a sudden say, "Okay, now we're back to regular." Yes, you're already digging out from a hole. You didn't even get your face at the water level. You're still below water. Yes, and so as these wealthy, uh, <laughs> anecdotally. I have family who is of the Northern Virginia variety and they, you know, were like, Steve, Mike, you know, cause everybody comes to see the sick parent at the hospital, at the hospital, haven't seen me in a little while. And they're like, you really need to take care of yourself. You really need to go get your teeth fixed. You really need to go, you know, to a dietitian and get your weight under control. You really need, hey, you should go see my masseuse. <laughs> and I'm like looking at him I'm like my eye is like shaking with like tremors, like rage getting ready to erupt. And I'm just like, wow, see, this is the false positives. The, yeah. the people are tone deaf to what's really happening. Yes. Oh, and my so God. Each of these things just it fundamentally it's like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, you know, I uh, I want to be able to take three months off at a time and uh, like to be able to go on a safari now and then. But otherwise, I've got a pretty decent job. You know, it's not too stressful. How about you? <laughs> well, listen, I'll tell you, I saw my brother the other day for the for the holiday and he told me that he <laughs> bought another condo in uh, New York. <clears throat> he lives in L.A., but he has three condos now in New York. And I said, another condo. And he says, oh. I won a hundred grand in a poker game, so I thought I would just use it as a down payment. And I thought, man, you wow. don't have any idea how normal people live. Yeah. No idea. Yeah. It's, it, you know, and, and the thing is, and I think this might be, this, you know, I know we're a little out of phase here because the concept is, is kind of abstract, but I think it all plays into what your questions are, right? When you think about the average person that didn't, have everything go perfectly in their life. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and you look at where they are and then you look at the beautiful people, the beautiful people, dun, dun, you know, you look yeah. at them and they just haven't got a clue. Oh, you mean to tell me that I don't have access to the best doctors? Oh, you mean to tell me that I don't have an investment portfolio? Whatever did I do wrong? Yeah. Shame on me. Isn't that the truth? And and so the everything that you see going on right now, the bourgeois Democrats, they, they, they're supposed to be for the working class, but the working class has no advocate here. And so they get this mean average of income, this mean average of inflation, this mean average of everything. And it's always skewed by these people that have bought their third, you know, Land Rover. Yeah. And the <laughs> second one is just a toy as well as the Tesla that they play with for spare parts for their other Tesla, you know, pet project. You yes. know, I mean, just it, this is reality, man. It is. This is DC reality. This is this is what these people think 
And when I'm sitting there, like having a, a tooth literally broken off at the gum line, and I'm thinking to myself, gosh, what, what, what bill do I not pay so I can try to get some antibiotics so I don't go sepsi, yeah. <laughs> septic here. Right. You know, what do I do? And, and it's like, oh, you're not, you have a kid. Don't forget about your child, Steve. Don't be irresponsible. Right. It's crazy. You know? And you think to yourself, this is literally the society we live in right now. It is indeed. You know, and, so, and we can say the same thing too about, about unemployment. We're hearing today about what they're calling persistently low unemployment, which is which is great. It remains at three point seven percent and has now gone two years under four percent. Economists tell us that full employment is five percent because at any given time, five percent of the workforce will be between jobs. But we all know that the way they count unemployment is a scam. It's always it been a scam. So what's yes. what's the downside to these numbers? I mean, I I. When I see these numbers for a brief fleeting second, I, I say, wow, 3.7%, that's great. And then I say, wait a minute, 3 point seven, they're making these numbers up, 3.7%. Because how many people do you know who have two jobs or three jobs? Well, it's like the Dead Kennedy song. Your number has been purged yes. from our supercomputer. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You, you know, I, let me let me say this. I just uh, spoke to a guy who is part of a international job guarantee coalition. OK, and these numbers that you hear, these three point sevens and stuff like that, they really do not tell the story because they, they stop counting certain individuals that are looking for work and they don't really count people who are underemployed and not really yeah. like they don't really take those into account. It's like, hey, they got work. And when I look at the kind of work I do, I'm a project slash program manager in my non-activist life. And, you know, you think to yourself, wow, that, that, that's, that's a pretty good job, you know, senior program manager. Wow, right? Right. And you look around and you're like, the, the pay scale that is available today is what the pay scale was in year 2000. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. literally... The cost of living has gone up exponentially yeah. since 2000. But the pay, and let me just say that they are living and dying by contract work. Yes. Contract work does not guarantee you get no paid time off. Mm -hmm. You get no security whatsoever. Yes. And so no when benefits. you start thinking about how they're making these numbers and how they're, how they're assessing the health of an economy, they need to talk to the person that's sitting there with spider web pains in their chest as they're sitting there worrying about whether or not they're going to get laid off mm -hmm. as they worry about AI taking their job, as they worry about, you know, whether or not they can afford to even get to work because of gas and everything else. Yeah. And so I just think that the, the balkanization of America is near completion. The, the, true divide between the haves and the have nots, I don't think has ever been greater. The, the, the inequality is so fundamental down to the, you know, when you don't take care of children at a young age to ensure that their health is really taken care of for the first couple years, that literally programs the body mm -hmm. for early death. It mm -hmm. literally is a death sentence. A young, you're going to lose years of your life, and it gets away without it being called murder. Yes. But this is the fundamental difference in inequality that we're dealing with in America right now. And it comes down to these <laughs> averages, the average income, the average cost, the average price, these indexes that ultimately tell the wrong story. They tell a story for one group of people. It's the only people that matter, the wealthy. Yeah. The rest of us, we look at it in awe and say, wow, where did they come up with that shit? Excuse my French. I'm sorry about that. I just, I don't understand how they can fundamentally get away with it. But when you own the media, when you own yep. all, you know, as, aspects of American communication. Yeah. We are the most propagandized nation in the world. And, and it, so sure this is what you get. it sure seems Absolutely. that way. It sure seems that way. So talk some sense to us about this, uh, this news that the national debt has crossed the $34 trillion mark. As soon as I heard this, I thought of you. 
Um, <laughs> does this matter? Is this important? No. No, not even a little bit. Not even, so. not even a little bit. And and, and so li- it's like really big numbers, scary fear of really big numbers. And really, at the end of the day, the national debt is the sum total of every untaxed dollar in the economy. That's it. And so what ends up happening is the nation chooses to raise interest rates as it just did. And every penny spent in the payment of interest is new debt because that's new money. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately by selling bonds and stuff like that, which is a choice, it's got nothing to do with the need for the government to fund itself. These are all political choices. Mm -hmm. And the government itself pays every single penny of those bond uh, interest payments, you name it, with brand new money. None of this is like coming from a taxpayer. None of it is coming from any. So ultimately at the end of the day, the national debt is a big number that scares people for no reason. It is just literally the sum total of every untaxed dollar in the economy. If you if you balance the budget, if you pay down the debt, guess what you inherently just did? You removed money from the economy. Yeah, that's true. So when when you tax, when you tax, you are literally clearing out reserves. Sorry about the sound there. No, that's okay. You clear out reserves from the banking system, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's all the tax is there to do is to purge the reserves. Because when the nation, when, when Congress authorizes spending, okay, the Fed will go ahead and keystroke dollars into whatever account the federal government said, hey, we've got to spend this money, put it here. When they do that, they create a corresponding reserve, which doesn't ever leave the system. It stays in the system to help clear payments between banks, between institutions. Mm -hmm. When you are taxed, that tax dollar is deleted. And by deletion, it's like the dark and the light crystal from the old movie. When the two come together, they, they, they cancel one another out here. And in this case, the tax comes back and it purges the reserve and it's done. Right. Whoop de doo, Basil. Whoop de doo. <laughs> so, my point is, is that all this stuff about, oh my God, the, the, the national debt's a really big number. Well, yeah, we had a lot of things we had to do. Yeah. Not the least of which was you guys funneling boatloads of money to the wealthy with these this so called soft landing of the Fed. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I want, I'm going to say this. I think I've said this before, and I'll probably say it every time someone brings me on to talk about this. There is a wonderful economist slash academic named Isabella Weber, and she went ballistic documenting. It's all over the New York Times, it's all over everywhere, documenting that this right here is seller's inflation. They are literally testing the realm of how high they can jack prices up. Mm. This is greedflation. This is not, oh my God, hey, you libertarians, they, they printed money so we got inflation. Right. No, this is this is the real story. This is your, your beloved capitalism right. paying off the wealthy has nothing whatsoever to do with the quantity of money in circulation. That is if you are on a gold standard, which we are not, sorry, Bitcoiners. Yes. So as a result of that, you get a lot of fraudulent claims made by those people that fuel the fear that many voters feel. Because obviously if you're a Bitcoiner and you're selling vapor and you want somebody else to buy your vapor so that you can jack yours up so you can cash mm-hmm. out later, mm-hmm. you need them to feel like there's some real advantage to doing this. So they yeah. make the dollar, which by the way is what they trade their Bitcoin in for. It's true. They make the dollar feel like, oh my God, it's going to collapse. Well, what do you think is your Bitcoin is riding on? But they use this whole idea of, oh my God, they printed money so the dollar's unstable. And what happens if the Standard and Poor's downgrades the U.S. debt. Right. Who cares? Right. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> it's hilarious. And but the thing is, is that I, like I will talk to you, and you're one of the good guys. You listen to me. You you put it out there. But this isn't your natural game. No. So twenty minutes later, somebody's going to say something about the debt, and you can be like, "Yeah, man, wow, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, what a big problem." <laughs> 
<laughs> right. You know? And and this this is they know this, right? So guys like me look like that fool on the corner with the John 316 sign by herself <laughs> screaming off in the dark. We're behind the goalpost at the football game with the John 316 sign. <laughs> no. and, and this is kind of par for the course. This is what happens. And poor Stephanie Kelton, great economist. She was on NPR the other day. They gave her four minutes and 30 seconds to tell something that takes at least 10 minutes. Oh, my God. And by the time she got midway through her sentence, she goes, okay, that's it. We're, we're, our time is up. <laughs> and so everybody that ever had a concern about this stuff still has a concern about this stuff because yeah. they never heard the rest of the story. They would make time for nonsense but not the real sense. And that's the problem. We have been lied to so much that the path forward is just truth. And truth is a hard thing to come by when everybody has been misled. Isn't that the truth? I wanted to turn to politics too, Steve. Joe Biden apparently has made a decision to focus his campaign on Pennsylvania. And as I said in the intro, that sounds like a great strategy if it's 1980. But what about 2024? Shouldn't Biden be worried about all seven battleground states. Trump's going to win all the red states. Biden's going to win all the blue states. And the presidential election is in these remaining seven states, is it not? Well, you know, think about this, right? We've got an electoral college. Their vote right. really isn't going to do much for them anyway. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, it, regardless of the fact that we don't have a democracy in this country to begin with, um, you know, Biden, Biden is has, you know, let a lot of people down. His stance on Israel and Gaza is beyond reprehensible. Um, the, the people that he should have been able to count on, if you believe in this game, have turned on him because he mm. didn't follow through. Mm-hmm. He didn't give them $15 an hour minimum That's wage. Right. He did not provide them with $2,000 checks. He did not do the student debt. He did not fight the way he needed to fight for the student debt. And there were things out there that he could have done. So at, on every possible level, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Joe Biden has screwed his base. And let me just say this, that make it even worse. You know, we everybody said we've got to we got to rush out there to vote for Biden because kids are in cages and Trump wants to build a wall and blah blah blah. Well, guess what? Biden is doubling down on the wall. Yeah. Right now, as we speak. Yes. So him being in battleground states, you know, I I I I'll be honest with you. I couldn't tell you what his strategy is. It doesn't make any sense to me at all no. because either a we're filled to the rim with brim in a country full of people that just can't stand immigrants or Biden is just literally saying, Hey, I don't care about the left. They're going to do it anyway. Cause they know every single vote blue sycophant is going to shame and guilt anybody for not supporting by what do you want? Trump. Mm-hmm. So he's counting on that by courting that, that squishy moderate Republican again. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is his strategy. It's the only strategy that makes any sense based on his, his approach. Cause he certainly has alienated everybody that is, you know, even kind of aligned with Bernie still Mm -hmm. much less anyone else for that matter. That's, that's kind of left of, you know, Stalin or left of Hitler, I should say, (laughs) you know, in this case, it's really a, it's really a terrifying thing to see. I mean, the, I, I, I gotta come back to Gaza real quick because that is so poisonous what he's done. The, the bypassing of Congress to ensure Israel gets more money and more weapons to, to do this stuff. I don't know how you win an election that way. I just don't know how. Is APEC that strong? Yeah, seriously. It, it, is, you, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just, I, I cannot fathom what kind of electoral strategy one employs by basically sitting there teaching everybody. You wonder what it was like to be at the Holocaust in Germany. Well, you're doing it. What you're doing right now is it. You're it. This is it. This is what you do in a Holocaust. This is what happens in a genocide. Whatever you're doing now, that's what happens. Nothing. You've ignored it. You, it we're all tuned up to it. So Biden's counting on us. Not Karen. Mm -hmm. Biden's counting on us buying into all the propaganda about these terrorists. Right. And uh, I I, I said this once to somebody and I'll I'll run it by you. If you've got me trapped 
in a basement, locked up in chains, your foot on my throat in a mud puddle, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I do something to you and hurt you. I have every right to try to free myself. Mm -hmm. I have every right to defend myself. I have every right to fight back, to say mas, to act like the world started and ended on October 7th or you know, whatever. It, it's preposterous. The idea that we can somehow or another fundamentally ignore everything since 1948. Mm-hmm. And we mm-hmm. can just fundamentally ignore what's been going on and pretend like these people are just savages. Yeah. It is, is, I, I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed to be an American right now. Oh, man. Steve, um, I, I agree with you. I, you know, I love politics more than most anything else that's out there. I just love it. I, I get up first thing in the morning after I play Angry Birds. I turn to Politico and The Hill and Politics and The Times and The Post and 538 and what have you. Uh, this race is boring, really boring. It's a rematch of two mean old men. And, um, you know, so we're looking for a storyline, not, I mean, we're not, but the mainstream media is looking for a storyline in, in Iowa. They're saying that really it's the race for number two. DeSantis has more to lose than Nikki Haley does. Haley's polling strongly in New Hampshire. So I've been thinking about this. Haley and, and DeSantis are tied in Iowa. Haley's going on to two states where she should perform well, New Hampshire where she's consistently uh, pulled well and her home state of South Carolina. So before we get too ahead of ourselves, uh, does DeSantis have anything to look forward to or is he, is he pretty well done? Look, I, I think a lot of people are counting on Trump being left off the ballot. I think that's what general. the key is. That's the key. That's why everybody yes. else is running. Just in case Trump gets thrown off, then they'll that's be correct. there to step into the breach. But otherwise, nobody's got that's a prayer. Not a prayer. Yeah. And, and you know, and that includes Biden, right? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think they, that's right. They, they, they have, when you create the groundwork that allows somebody like Donald Trump to somehow or another, after everything that he has done, look better than he did before Mm -hmm. because Biden is is bad. And when you look at the GOP and what they did, you know, we talked about it when McCarthy was basically put out of the house, uh, you know, now he's going to resign with a big giant middle finger to the caucus. Right. Right. And you think about this, they are, they're in really bad shape. If, if, if you, if you, if you don't believe it's just theater, if you're really sitting there gripping and holding on and waiting for everything they do, then he's put them in a really bad place. And that extrapolates out to the presidential election as well. Yes. And so to me, the humor and both the intrigue, if you're going to follow this stuff like that has got to be to see what storyline they're going to use to either a resuscitate Donald Trump. When I say resuscitate, he's, he's clearly ahead, but in terms of he's kind of ahead in a fringe way, he's not ahead like front and center because Mm -hmm. he's got too many things attacking him. Mm -hmm. You're getting to see Haley out front. You're getting to see DeSantis out front because they're, they're flying those balloons out there to see do these can either of them hold court. Right. And You know, that to me is the lone intrigue here is which of these people can grab somebody's attention and grab their imagination. And none of them have anything of value to add. Everything I heard from all of them is either Hitler light or or just completely and utterly just gross. I mean, Haley's response on the Civil War is so pathetic and and just uninformed i you you listen to these people and you say wow just wow yeah. Where, wow how could you be this dumb but it's not so much dumb it's their base is that dumb and they're having to appeal to their base because if they acknowledge anything other than 10th amendment you know <laughs> you know 10th amendment right <laughs> if they don't if they go anywhere other than 10th amendment if they acknowledge i, I mean just just i guess yesterday 
maybe it was the day before, Mark Cuban went out there and had to lecture Elon Musk why diversity was not racism. You know? <laughs> this is the kind of stupid the people on the right are dealing with. They're yeah. just not bright people. And they're terrified of losing their white privilege. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know what? Uh, to me, at the end of the day, I don't find anything about this interesting. I think you're right. It, it is boring. I kind of, there's a part of me that's happy that it's boring because I'm hoping that people start waking up and realizing if this were a real election, if this were real democracy, somebody would have your attention right now. Something would be driving you. Yeah. But instead, you know that you're suffering. All the stuff we talked about with the economy, all the stuff we talked about the inequality, people know there's none of these people that are going to do anything good for them whatsoever. Yeah. Nothing good for them is coming from this. So more and more and more people are just checking out of the process. Yeah. Now yeah. the question is, can we get them to check into building dual power, building mutual aid, building uh, parallel systems so that we can let this system collapse on itself mm -hmm. because the people aren't going to vote They're They see no agency in this system. They see no champion for their cause. Yes. So they say, why, why am I going to waste my time with this? Yeah. I think that's, so, I think that's true. I think that's true. Uh, I wanted to ask you too about the Teamsters union. I, I try to follow developments in organized labor closely Many Democrats thought that the, that the Teamsters Union's endorsement this year would be a gimme for, for Joe Biden. Remember, Biden has described himself as the most pro-labor president <laughs> in history. Uh, but not only is the union going to meet with both candidates formally because making, uh, before making an endorsement, but Donald Trump is going to meet with the Teamsters leadership informally, privately. What does this mean? What should we take from this? And how big of a problem might this be for Joe Biden? Well, I think he, Joe Biden really, really did a number of things that were very, very damaging to unions. Um, you know, basically forcing people back to work. I mean, looking at the um, the railway workers, that, that mm -hmm. really stands out in a lot of people's minds still, you know? Yeah. And the the idea that he pulled a Ronald Reagan, basically. Yes. And then you think to yourself also the types of rules that they use to to handcuff themselves, you know, to to say we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. People, I think, are saying, hey, this this guy, they you know, I hear all this stuff about the National Labor Review Board and how a lot of these things wouldn't be possible were it not for. Uh, some of the steps that Biden and some of his appointments have made. Um, and there may be some truth to that, right? I, I don't want to, like, I don't want to come off, you know, completely just, you know, one-sided here. But, I, I mean, my one side isn't on either of their sides, quite clearly. Yeah, but yeah. When it comes to, uh, you know, Joe Biden, I, I don't see any of the above as true. And I know that there are people out there who, you know, allow any kind of, you know, sweet talk to resonate with them and make them feel buoyed up and, you know, oh, he's fighting for me. But that just doesn't pass the smell test. People's expectations and hopes are so utterly diminished mm -hmm. that I, 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 they would be fools not to sell themselves both directions to say, hey, are you going to take care of my issues? Right. Are you going to take care of my issues? I, you know, I don't really care at this point. You both are horrific. You, you know, Joe, you're, you, you go by the name of genocide Joe now and Trump, yeah. my God, if you haven't gone to jail yet, you're never going to jail. So, you know, which one of you guys is going to take my issue? I don't care. Mm -hmm. you're, you're both awful. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do for me? Yeah. That's and true. I think that's where we're at. We're in an age of practical politics. Yeah. I'm not optimistic. I'm not optimistic about no. the way things uh, things are going. And, you know, just one final thought, too. You know, I remember being so angry uh, during the 1988 election where there were there were real issues to be debated. And George H.W. Bush was successful in turning the debate so that the the issues were flag burning and saying the Pledge of Allegiance in the schools. Right. And that was enough yep. to win. Well, now. What's everybody talking about on social media? Uh, does uh, Donald Trump wear a Depends diaper? And now you've got <laughs> Bob Woodward coming out and saying, oh, I can't even stand next to him because he doesn't change his diaper enough and he smells so strongly of pee. And his former valet says, oh, we always had to have a box of Depends on set 
uh, at the apprentice because he would poop his pants. And like, I, for, first of all, I don't care. I don't care if the man wears the pens. A lot of people, a lot of senior citizens have a problem and they wear the pens. I don't care. There are real issues that we need to be debating. And it seems like nobody wants to talk about them. Well, I don't think either of these candidates carry with them real issues. I don't think, yeah, I, I think that I agree. many of the issues that both of them bring up depends or no depends. And I wouldn't doubt if either of them <laughs> or both of them wear it. Um, but to me, they're both manufacturing storylines. Yeah. They're both manufacturing them. And then when they create these things, they've got a team of people that are far more willing to retweet and share people's stuff. They retweet their stuff ad nauseum. Yes. And you know full well that this is the, the new line. This is the new narrative. And they're very effective at getting it out. The activists would only get back through their head. We'd be, you know, <laughs> we'd be making yeah. some hay. Yeah, it's um, true. But you know, they they are very good at tweeting and retweeting and getting words out and repeating them and through all their different, you know, not only media contacts, but through all their communication paths, they repeat the same message and then it becomes the message. Mm -hmm. So the things that matter to us, we're talking about them right now. We're talking about, you know, these fake numbers that give people a false sense of the economy's great. And you look at all the homelessness. Right. Right. Which is. As bad as it's ever been. Because, you know, lumber sale, sales went up or house sales went up. Right. Yeah. And it's just it's just horrible. So I don't think I don't think there's going to be much interest, if you will, in this election, John. Yeah. Because, quite frankly, nobody's real interests are being covered. No. It's only those people that have the freedom to enjoy the fake news that they're being shoved down that are going to really find interest mm -hmm. in this craziness. I so. agree. Steve Grumbine, that's thank my, you so much for joining us. Bro. Steve is the founder and yes, CEO sir. of the nonprofits Real Progressives and Real Progress in Action. He's the host of the podcast Macro and Tease, and he's a leading activist and evangelist for modern monetary theory. You're listening to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik. We're going to take another break, and then we're going to come back with news of the weird. Stay tuned.